I am absolutely delighted to welcome Professor Mel Ainsco. Um, I think Mel doesn't need any introduction to most people on the call. Um, Mel is originally from Manchester. We were comparing similar accents earlier on and okay. discovered that we are, our birthplaces are about 20 miles apart down in, down in Lancashire and Manchester. Um, so Mel is a former head teacher, um, local education authority advisor, teacher educator, professor. Um, he returned to his Mancunian roots in 1995 and was appointed as Professor of Education at that point. And quite, quite recently, I couldn't find the actual date, I think it was about 2018-19, Mel. Um, you moved up to Bonnie, Scotland, to the University of Glasgow as Professor of Education um, and that's your, your current, current role. Um, as everybody on the call will be very well aware, Mel is internationally recognised for his work on the promotion of inclusion and equity in education. Um, Mel's published extensively. I think the, 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 the first time I became aware of Mel was back in 2002 and I was working in a special school in Cumbria and our head teacher brought in this very shiny folder called the Index for Inclusion and said this document will change all of our lives <laughs> and she was right it, it was life-changing for us as teachers in, in very segregated specialist provision and for the children that were in our classes um, and Mel has of course published much, much more prolifically over the, over the past 20 or so years. Um, and perhaps one of the more recent, very relevant publications has been about international progress 25 years on from the Salamanca Statement that came out just, just before we hit the pandemic. Um, so we are absolutely honoured to welcome Mel as our guest today to the CIRA Inclusive Education Network. And we very much look forward to hearing from him. So without further ado, I will get your slide deck ready to share Mel and oh, I will hand over to you. So so if you just tell me when to move slides on um, okay. once I've shared them. OK, Dave, thank you very much and hello to everybody. I, I realise looking down the list, I've got quite a few uh, friends in various places who've joined us, so it's nice to make contact. Uh, should explain that we've had a bit of a problem with the slides. I'm technically incompetent, but thankfully Di has been able to sort those out for me. And there you are, you've got the slide. So that's the title and that's what I'm going to speak to. Um, over those years that Di's talked about, uh, I have had the privilege of working internationally as well as in the UK and much of that work has gone through uh, UNESCO which is as you know the United Nations organization uh, most concerned with education and uh, I've been acting as a consultant for UNESCO on a whole series of projects and publications which I'll mention during the talk. So it's taken me to different parts of the world and allowed me to learn from experience as I'm going to talk to you about. Thank you Di. So just a little about the, the, the global situation. Um, since 1990, the United Nations organization, as, uh, organizations have really pushed the idea of what they called in 1990, education for all. And I quite like that phrase, education for all, um, because we often slip into jargon, which can be a barrier to kind of people's understanding. But over those years since 1990, there's been a whole series of developments and all this came to a head in uh, 2016 with the announcement that there were going to be 17 uh, sustainable development goals. And that little circle that you can see on the slide is indicating the 17 uh, um, goals. And number four, which is highlighted, is the one which is about education. And the argument that's been going on in the global debate about all of this is that actually education, global, the, the sustainable development goal four, is the key to everything. If you want to improve economic development, cultural development, social development, strengthen democracy within a country, then education is the way forward. 
And of course, central to the way in which education is being formulated is this Education 2030 policy, which governments are being encouraged to follow. And what it talks about is inclusion and equity. And I think the two words together are quite important because equity reminds us about fairness, which I think is central to what we're talking about, is the cornerstone of a transformative education agenda. So what we're talking about is the transformation of education systems to make them places where all children can be valued and can be helped to move forward. Thank you. So that's the agenda that I'm going to talk to. In that global situation, what does this mean for practice? It's OK having these kind of political documents which are very inspiring and very helpful in terms of the debate, but they don't tell us what to do on the ground. And of course, ultimately, it's what happens in schools and especially classrooms that would make a difference. So this is the question I'm going to address. How can we promote inclusion and equity in our schools? And I'm going to focus particularly on practice. And then I hope if this time at the end, uh, we'll talk a little bit about policy, but that comes as a kind of addendum at the end of all of this. Thank you. So we're going to go on a journey around the world and we're going to visit classrooms and we're going to hear my stories of what I saw in those classrooms. And I'm, what I'm going to do is to draw what I've called a series of lessons from these experiences. So we're going to travel a long way and there could be some turbulence. So you may want to fasten your seat belts. OK, the first place we're going to then is China. And I know that we have at least one person on the call who is a student from China and nice that she's with us. I first went to China as part of my UNESCO work many years ago. And at that point, we were linked with uh, a, a research institute in Beijing. And of course, being there for the first time, I had to learn about things and find out about people. The first thing I found out was that I was told that as a visitor, I was to be introduced as a international expert. And I found that a bit intimidating. And it got worse then because they gave me a little book, which is a guide for international experts. And so everywhere I went, I was introduced as Professor Ainscrow from England, he's an international expert. And of course, what I was supposed to be an international expert in was this idea of inclusive education. And so, of course, people were expecting me to give them some ideas and so on. So off I went with an interpreter, of course, to visit some schools. And here's where the first shock arrived. I go into a classroom. This is the one I took a photograph. I'm not a very good photographer, you'll realize. And the first thing I saw that was approximately 70 children in the room. 70 children. Now, we complain in the United Kingdom if there's 30 children, and quite rightly so, the idea of 70 children. So here is this international expert expected to advise teachers and other people what to do to make a classroom of 70 children more inclusive. So what am I going to do? Well, what I did do in this classroom and in a number of other classrooms is with the help of the interpreter, I watched what was going on, I listened to what happened and I tried to make sense of it. And I had what was in a sense a kind of life changing experience really in these Chinese classrooms because what I realised that many of the Chinese teachers that I was watching and listening to were remarkably skillful at orchestrating this vast crowd of children that were being educated. So I started to think carefully about what is it they're doing to engage all of these children? Thank you. Well, one of the things they did very successfully was that they used questioning. And quite often in the lesson, they would ask questions and the children would be asked to answer corally all together. But then again, then a few minutes later, they would then ask the children to put their hands up if they were able to answer individually. And then I noticed as you see in the picture, that they had a particular way of showing that they were ready to answer, a kind of salute type uh, uh, motion with their hand. Now, this is an interesting thing. You see, you go in schools, as I've done all over the world, and schools and classrooms are very similar, except when you start to look at the detail. You see, I used to, I used to go work in Romania, in Eastern Europe, and the children there would put their hands up and they'd do this. And then, of course, in England and in Scotland, usually the children wave, but there in, in, in Beijing, they're using this kind of salute. So very interesting. I then noticed something else was that sometimes 
the teachers asked the children to reply who did not have their hands put up. Now here was the kind of simple practical technique that experienced teachers use to make sure the children are listening and participating in the lesson. There's a sense of uncertainty that at any time you might be asked. So you must be listening, you must be engaging, you must be taking part in the lesson. After the lesson, I also talked with some of the teachers and they told me about other things that were going on in their school. They explained, for example, that it was the custom that the more successful learners were expected to help the less successful learners to keep up. And they tended to use kind of military style language. They talked about all the children have got to march together. And they said what happens is that the children in, in the break time and at lunch time, some of them will help the children who are not experiencing success to see if they can move forward. And I saw that going on in the corridors. Interestingly, as an aside, in, in parts of Asia, if you go into tea shops, coffee shops, for example, in Singapore, if you go into the McDonald's restaurant, you might go there to have a coffee or whatever. If you go into McDonald's in Singapore, you'll see there are little signs around the, the wall. And the signs say no studying. Now, we don't tend to have signs saying no studying in McDonald's in Manchester. But what, what happens in Singapore, it happens in Hong Kong, it happens in places in and around China, is because the children want to help one another and do their homework together, and because many of them live in very small cramped conditions, then they go to a tea room, or they go to the library, or they go to the railway station, and they find places to work together. So what I felt I was learning here was how traditions, local ways of doing things, were a way of helping all the children to feel included. So here was my first and possibly most important lesson. Thank you. A slight hitch. That when we're talking about moving practice forward in a school, whether it's in Beijing or whether it's in Burnley or whether it's in Dundee or wherever, um, the starting point is with existing skills and knowledge. It's not about looking outwards, it's looking inwards. And in schools that I've worked with that have made progress, one of the most important things they do is that they move knowledge around within the school community. People talk about practice, and I'll come back to that. People share ideas and help one another to move forward. Very often, we're told to look outwards, come to an event like this, read a book, go on a course. I'm not saying any of those are things are irrelevant, but in a sense, they're the cream on the cake. The way to move practice forward is to make better use of the expertise that's there. And it's always there. In my experience, schools know more than they use. There is always more knowledge, more skill, more creativity lying latent in a school that is currently being used. OK, pass your seatbelts again. We'll move now and we'll go to Ghana in West Africa. Ghana is a beautiful country on the equator. It's hot and steamy all through the year. As part of my work with UNESCO again some years ago, I visited this primary school, which is a village school, and there's only one village in the school, um, to again as part of a process of trying to learn from and help people to move practice forward. If you look at the picture carefully, you'll see that there's one young lady, a girl, who is uh, rather larger than the other children in the room. Um, I guess she's probably resitting the grade or maybe she moved into the area, whatever, but she's with these younger children. I didn't get a picture of it, but if I'd have been there earlier, I, I would have seen that some of the children bring a chair to school from home because there aren't enough chairs. There aren't windows, there are just these kind of gaps in the wall because the, the building is quite primitive, as you can see. And of course, if there is a visitor, especially a visitor with a white face, then you get people from the local community coming to see what's going on. I asked the teacher in one of the classrooms, what, what, what could we do to help you? I come from UNESCO and want to help you to make your lessons more inclusive. And he said to me, well, if I can have more books, I've only got one book for each lesson and I have to read the book the night before and then I write bits, things on the blackboard so the children can see it. If they could all have a book or at least if they could share a book. And I thought, well, what does it cost to fly me all the way to Ghana? And now all, all the, the teacher wants is, is some books. Anyway, 
Going around the school, I saw this student. He clearly had some kind of physical impairment, and I was told that his father had made this stick for him so he could go to the school. When I got chance, I said to the teacher of this particular class, how is it that this boy comes to your school? And he looked at me as if I was sort of crazy. And I said, you know, how is it that this boy comes to your school? And he said to me, where else would he go? And you see, this is a village school. All the children go to it. All the teachers live in the village. It's part of the community. Where else would he go? I was asking the question from the from the north, from from Europe, from UK, you know, that where we have alternatives of special provision. This approach has sometimes been called casual integration. It just happens. It's it's taken for granted. I said to the teacher, well, what special arrangements do you make for him? And uh, again, he, he, I think he thought I was a bit crazy, but he was trying to be kind. And he said, um, he said, well, most of the time there's no issues, he said, but like when we're doing sport or physical education, uh, it, it can be a bit of a difficulty, but the other children help him. And I'm thinking, you know, we make such a sort of science of all of this, so, so complicated all of this, but it's really about people helping one another, people supporting one another. So my second lesson really is about how we view differences. Do we see differences as a problem to be fixed or taken away? Or do we value differences? Do we see that differences actually can be a stimulus to us, can help us to innovate, help us to think about new ways of working, help us to use human resources more effectively to make sure that every member of the class is valued and feels that they are making a contribution? OK, off we go now and we're going to Austria in Europe. It's just before Christmas I mean, I'm visiting a school near to the city, capital city of Vienna. Um, a very different situation. Next slide, please. Look at the resources now and compare them with uh, with Ghana. Uh, there are about 17 or 18 children in the class. The physical resources are fantastic. The materials, you know, this is this is what every child in the world should have in a way. Uh, it is just before Christmas. Uh, the teacher introduces the lesson, which is going to be about calendars. So they're going to make calendars, which they're going to take home, and they discuss what a calendar was. And they've got all these lovely materials, and the children seemed particularly interested in what this was about. While this was going on, there was another pupil, student, sitting at the back of the room, a boy, and sitting with him was another adult. And this adult, who actually was a qualified teacher, a support teacher, was there because this boy had been categorised as having sp special educational needs. While the lesson was going on, the support teacher worked separately with the boy at the back of the room. And sometimes she even stood in front of him so that he wouldn't be distracted by what's happening with the rest of the class. No, it's obviously a great idea to have two adults in the room, and I'm all for that if and when it's necessary. But then I start to think, well, I'm interested in inclusion. I'm interested in everybody being there and being participating and learning together. Is this inclusion or is this a new kind of segregation? Is this segregation in the classroom? Is this an unintentional barrier that's created because of a way in which this extra teacher is being used. You see, the idea of two, two adults in the room is a fantastic thing. You can do all sorts of possibilities of team teaching and different kind of coordinated arrangements, such that all the children in the, in the classroom would benefit. But in the way this was conducted in this classroom, in fact, I think the, the support teacher unintentionally was a barrier to this child being more active in the classroom, learning from the other children, contributing to what's going on. So in thinking about how we make progress in relation to inclusion, I think we have to focus on the concept of barriers. So that's my third lesson. We have to identify and address barriers to participation and learning. Now, barriers can take many forms. I've given one example. The curriculum can be a barrier. 
if it's not designed for all children. The forms of assessment that we use can be a barrier if we don't celebrate the progress of every child, some of whom may be making relatively slow progress. Of course, our skills as teachers can be a barrier if we don't know how to organise a classroom and plan the lesson so that every child can feel that they can participate and learn. Some of the most difficult barriers, of course, are the barriers in our minds, the limitations of our own experience. I don't really believe it's possible for all these children to be here and learn together. And if I don't believe it, then it's not going to happen. Notice I am not talking about barriers within children. I'm not saying what's wrong with the child. What are we going to do to fix him or her? That's the old thinking. That's what's sometimes called the medical model, the model on which the world of special education grew. And I was a teacher and a head teacher in a special school, so I'm part of that tradition. This is the transformative approach that United Nations organizers are talking about, where we're saying actually every child has a right to be there with the brothers and sisters, with the other kids who live in their district and in their street. And what we have to do is finding ways of ensuring that they are valued and are taking part. And it is about addressing the, the barriers in the context. OK, here we go again. We're going to Asia. We're going to the small country of Laos. Laos is a small socialist country between Thailand, Cambodia and Vietnam. Uh, it's relatively isolated and so it doesn't get a lot of links from outside. And again, I was there as a kind of consultant from UNESCO. I watched this lesson in a, a primary school in the capital city of Vientiane. Very simple resources. Uh, and what happened was the teacher, youngish male teacher, explained to the children they were going to talk about nature and he created this picture which he'd obviously drawn the night before which was stuck on the notice at the front of the classroom and he talked to them about uh, birds and trees and flowers uh, and, and other things that are there in the local area where they all live. He talked to them for about 10 minutes and then he said okay and of course I'm listening to all of this from the interpreter. He said okay uh, now, I want you to think about this question. And he wrote a question on the board and he said, I want you to go into your groups and discuss this question. Immediately, the children turn around, as you see in the picture, and they started talking in groups. They would clearly done this before. They knew exactly what to do, how to go about it. Next picture, please. The classroom was transformed. These children who had been sitting passively, listening or maybe not listening, understanding or maybe not understanding, suddenly from being passive learners, they became active learners. Look at these boys in this particular group. Look at their faces, look at their eyes, look at their body language. One boy is making a note about what the children are, are talking about, but they are active. They're supporting one another's learning. Now, this experience, mirrors many others that I've had, where I see how creative practitioners find ways in even under kind of simple economic conditions, they find ways, creative ways of making sure that all children can be active in the lesson. You see, if, if, if this teacher had been on a course, Glasgow University or wherever, probably at some point he would have had lectures about the idea of cooperative group work and he would heard about the research. He'd not had any of that experience. He had created this way of working through his own professional commitment and through his own creativity. Now what we know from the formal research from the West is that this kind of cooperative group work, if it is appropriate in terms of the subject, if it is well planned and well organised, if the children are taught how to do it effectively, you're going to see improved outcomes in terms of academic learning amongst all of the children, in terms of behaviour and in terms of social learning. These children are learning not only the subject, but they're learning how to live together, how to learn together. Now, that's not about inclusion. That's about improving learning for all children. 
But then there's other research, which is about notions of inclusion, which comes to the same conclusion. It's research, for example, that looks at the integration of children with various kind of impairments, the integration of refugee children, the integration of children who may have been ill and in hospital for a long time. And it comes to the same conclusion. If you want to integrate somebody new, you need to place them in a classroom where this goes on sometimes so the child is not sitting silently in isolation, having to work on their own, but is actually being integrated into the social process of the classroom. So the conclusion I draw from these kind of experiences, which in a sense is, is crucial to the argument I'm putting forward, this is about inclusion, it is about equity, but it's also about excellence. Excellence brought about by a concern with every child, that every child matters, and we go to trying to find a way of making sure that every child is participating. OK, move on. So that's what I'm saying. This is about the use of human resources, making use particularly of the human resources, and they're always there in a school, in a classroom, and in fact, the more children you've got, the more resources you've got. So, on to another place. We're in a government school in the capital of India, New Delhi. Again, I know that we have at least one person on the call who is from India, so she will be familiar with some of the things I'm going to talk about. This was a, another first for me. I arrived in India, having not been there before. And as tends to happen, I'm afraid, is you tend to carry stereotype views in your mind Goodness knows where these come from, but you have expectations of what things are going to be like. And when I went to this government school in Delhi, in a quite poor area of the city, I expected to see quite formal lessons. I expected to see the children sitting in rows rather quietly, and I expected for the lesson to be much dominated by the voice of the teachers. And here I am in this school, and again, I experienced a surprise. There's a story running through my uh, accounts of experiencing new things that are a surprise, things I didn't expect. In this particular classroom, for example, the children were doing a lesson on the role of members of the family. And they worked in groups again. The issue of group work seems to be quite crucial, I think. And they were doing really what was a role play exercise. So they worked in groups, Within the, each of the groups, somebody would be the mother, somebody would be the father, someone would be the grandfather and so on. And they were doing a kind of problem solving task in relation to the role of families. It was extremely noisy, I have to say. It was very active and certainly all of the children were participating. At a moment in the lesson, the teacher asked the children to stop, be silent and sit down. Next slide, please. At that point, she asked the children to explain to the whole class what they had been learning. And so the children took it in turns to stand up and explain what they had been learning in their group work. Now, again, there's quite a bit of research about this. The idea of when children become teachers, when children themselves teach one another, the evidence seems to be that that helps all children to learn. It creates a, what is sometimes called a process of overlearning, where you talk to somebody else about something that you've already ex recently experienced yourself. At the end of the day, I had a meeting with some of the teachers and I came clean and I said, look, I'm really shocked. I came here from the UK. I didn't expect to see this. I didn't expect to see these very active lessons, which I saw different kinds of active lessons around the schools. And I said to them, how, do, how has this come about? And the teachers explained to me that about a year earlier, a new head teacher had arrived, a woman. They called her very respectfully, Madam. And they said, yes, Madam had come about a year ago. And she'd introduced a new policy. And the policy was this. Once a month on a Saturday morning, the teachers would come back to school and they'd take part in what they called workshops workshops where they would talk about the challenges of educating all the children and talked about what kind of methods they had found effective and how they might share them and use them. I was fortunate that I was able to go to one of the workshops. Next picture, please. 
And at the workshop, uh, I saw on a Saturday morning how uh, the head teacher led the discussion. She also had the help of a, a person from a local research institute who supported her, and they shared ideas amongst the teachers. They talked about practice, and they created these beautiful posters, which were there as a record of their discussions in previous uh, uh, workshops. If you could just move this slide on, please, Di. So around the school were these lovely posters. They were there for the children to see, the parents to see where they came in. But of course, for the teachers, they were kind of reminders of professional learning that had gone on in the school. The two women in the picture, the woman in the red sally is, is, the, is Madam, the head teacher, and the other woman is a, a woman from the Research Institute. Another analysis here, which I think is worth thinking about, the role of leadership. See, this woman, again, probably not familiar with a lot of the research from the West. I don't know, maybe she was, but no, I doubt it. She had worked out for herself what her role should be as a school leader. Talking about practice, taking an interest in improvements in teaching and learning, leading the workshops and showing that she is committed to teaching and learning. I asked the children and the teachers to tell me more about all this, and they said, well, it's not just the workshops. They said, we also have learned that when you're trying something out in your own classroom, when you're experimenting with a new way of working that's been discussed on the, uh, 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 at the workshop, uh, then you need help. And so what we do, whenever we can, we work in pairs. Two teachers will work together, trying out new approaches to making their lessons more effective, more inclusive. And I said, well, I don't understand how you do that. You've got quite large classes, 45 children, quite small classrooms. You know, how can you have two, two teachers together? You know, and you're all very busy. And they said, well, you know, sometimes Madam comes and takes one of the classes to release the teacher to come and work with me in my classroom. Again, leadership in action, not just talking the talk, but actually showing that they are prepared to support teachers in thinking about and developing their their practice but they said of course madam can't do that all the time it's a big school she has other things she has to do so we've had to find other ways of working together in pairs so that we can uh, help one another to move practice forward see this idea of working in pairs again there's lots of western research about that they call it peer coaching where two teachers work together, they plan together, they observe their practice, and as they're doing, they're involved in this process of peer coaching. And they said, so, you know, we have to find other ways of solving the problem. And they said, one of the things we do is we, uh, we sometimes we put two classes together so that the two of us can be team teaching. And I said that again, I don't understand how you can do that with these small classrooms. And they said, well, what we have to do is we take the children outside. Next slide, please. And again, I was lucky that I was able to see one of these experiences where the children were outside doing a cooperative exercise with two teachers who planned the lesson together and who were orchestrating the learning that was going on. I've used this slide a lot and it was only fairly recently somebody pointed something out to me uh, about the nature of the groups. I guess some of you may have already spotted it. It's clear there are girls groups and there are boys groups. I don't know if that was the decision of the teacher or whether that was the choice of the children, but it's interesting how these matters of de detail uh, uh, strike you. So the lesson I take from schools like that one in Delhi, which is my next lesson, please, is that what you have to create in the school is an atmosphere, a culture, I suppose you could call it, where the development of practice becomes everybody's business, where professional learning is built into the life of the school. It won't happen by chance. It has to be planned. Relationships have to be developed. Critically, time has to be found. And so the, the, the role of senior staff, not just the head teacher, is crucial in making this happen. Now, where this works, what it does, it creates a more inclusive atmosphere amongst the staff as well as the children. But it also solves another problem about moving practice around within the school. You see, I watch lots of 
lessons with teachers. And if I can, after the lesson, I sit down with a teacher and I say, this is what I've just seen. This is what I've just heard. I'm not here to inspect. I, this is not performance management. I'm trying to learn about your teaching. And uh, when I do that, often, especially with see, experienced teachers, they will express surprise. And they say, I don't remember doing that. Did I do that? And of course, what it reminds people like me who live in the kind of twilight zone of the education system is how demanding being a teacher is, how intensive it is. There's no time to think. There's no time to talk. So consequently, teachers find it very difficult to explain their practice. They can talk in generalities. When you ask them to say, explain what you did and why you did it, many teachers find that difficult. Now, the way to create a professional learning environment is to create the sort of opportunities that were there in that school in New Delhi, where children, where teachers are seeing one another teaching, are planning together, are having conversations, such that a language of practice is developed within the school. Not a language imposed from the university or from something you've read, or that might might help, but it's a language is created through social learning in 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 the workplace. So my final trip brings me home. This is a picture of a classroom in Brad Bradford in England. I'm working at the moment with a, a network of schools in Bradford. And in this particular network, the schools have created what they call learning threes. So each of the schools in the network are in, are in a trio, which is there for mutual learning. And the approach they're using is called peer inquiry. In other words, they're doing the kind of action research that I'm suggesting should be going in within a school, but also doing that between the schools. And on a particular morning in early December, I had the privilege of going with two head teachers as they visited the third school for a morning. And at the beginning of the meeting, at the beginning of the visit, they had a meeting with the host head teacher, and she talked to them about what she wanted the teachers to look at during the morning. So the visiting teachers then went into various classrooms in a very relaxed way, trying not to look like inspectors, and they observed what was going on as the teachers and the children worked together. Thank you. They also, of course, talked to the teachers. Next slide, please. And they also talked to the children. So essentially what they were, were kind of co-researchers investigating what was going on in the school. Next one, please. At the end of the morning, the teachers, the visitors met with the host head teacher and they talked about what they'd seen and what they heard. And of course, they had many positive things to say because it was a lovely school. It was great things going on. One of the visiting head teachers said at one point, I noticed something interesting. I should explain that this school and the other two schools serve extremely deprived in a, in a, in a city areas in Bradford. Children from in, in the main from very poor backgrounds. And what she said, well, I noticed in the early years classes, if there was not an adult with the child, the child rarely spoke, even though they might be sitting with other children, they didn't speak to each other. It was only when an adult was there to facilitate it. And she said, you know, what that's done for me is made me realise that's what happens in my school. You see, visiting another school, having the privilege of observing and talking is like a mirror. So in seeing that school, you see your own school in a new light, just as when you watch another teacher, it's like a mirror on your practice. So what I'm seeing in, a, in that sort of situation, the ways in which schools can actually learn from other, one another. And that's my sixth lesson. Thank you. I'm talking about the development of schools which are kind of learning organisations where there's a, pre a preoccupation with professional learning as teachers work together, planning, sharing and observing one another working. And what I'm suggesting is that can be extended where schools do that, not just individually, but do it through various kind of partnerships and groups and so on. So those are my lessons. I'm sure there are other things I could talk about, but I'm conscious of time. But let me summarise the six lessons for you, please. Next slide. First of all, it's about making better use of the skills and knowledge that exist within the school. It's about moving knowledge around. 
based on the assumption there is always more knowledge and creativity there within the school than is currently being used. So that is the starting point. Of course, time has to be found to make that happen. And sometimes when I'm talking to head teachers and I talk about all this sort of stuff, they say to me, well, I, somebody will say, well, I, I agree with you, Mel, but the problem is there isn't time. And I always say, well, then you don't agree with me. Time is the currency we use in schools to signal that something's important. If you believe, as I clearly do, that investing in the learning of your adults, your staff members, will pay off with the learning of the children, then you will find time. We'll find time. It can't, it's not easy, but I can take you to schools where that is going on. It's about valuing differences, the differences amongst the children, which can be a stimulus to innovation, but also differences amongst our colleagues. People have different ideas that can make us think and try new ways of working. Next one, please. It's about critically, I think, the importance of addressing barriers to participation and learning, recognising that these are contextual barriers, not the deficiencies of children that we used to talk about in the past. Recognising that all of us are different, every child is different, but recognising that when children have difficulties in participating in learning, it is usually about contextual barriers that we need to identify and address. So running through all of this, is an emphasis of schools which are places of collaborative action research. Schools are collecting evidence and using that evidence to stimulate their professional learning. It's about making use of resources, but especially human resources. That seems to be the key to moving a school forward. Thank you. And through all of that, as I've argued, what happens in a school over time, and this takes time and it needs to be nurtured, is a language of practice is developed that encourages people to share ideas and experiment with new ways of reaching the children we're not reaching at the moment. And finally, add to that the potential of schools to learn from one another. I'm absolutely convinced from all the work I've done that schools working in partnerships, networks, clusters, we use different words, this can add value to what's going on in the individual schools. Those ideas uh, are part of a sort of way of thinking about the development of inclusive schools. And recently, with my colleagues in UNESCO, we have published a resource pack on materials. So here's the commercial. Next slide, please. Um, a resource pack of materials called Reaching Out to All Learners. You can download it free. It's materials that are intended to be used for school based professional development. All the materials have been trialled in schools in different parts of the world uh, and, and, and can, with the right kind of organisation and leadership, help people to move forward. I want to go on in a little while and talk about policy, but at this point I want to stop and I would welcome comments questions please easy to questions but questions and i'll try to answer them as best i can okay over to you so just to, say to people, just to say to folks we are going to stop the recording just now while we have the discussion and we'll start it up again afterwards and if you want to either put your hand up to come in and comment or if you would like to pop a comment into the chat box and i will drop the link to the resource pack into the chat as well for folks that emerged from our discussion that led to this guide is what's at the bottom of the slide. Every learner matters and matters equally. Now, I take that mantra with me wherever I go. It's a, it's a matter of principle. This is why I'm here. This is what I'm committed to. I have to be honest with you. If you're working with me, this is what I'm going to keep banging on about. Now, next slide, please. So I, I work not just with individual or groups of schools, but I also occasionally have the privilege to work on system change, whether that's at a regional level or sometimes at a national level. And so I become interested in how policies change. Now, this slide, which I pictured off the website, kind of captures the dominant expectation of how policy changes. It comes from the top. It's passed down through a machine and there's the head teacher who receives it. And it's, of course, it's very neat and smart. 
It's the politicians doing what they should do, creating guidelines, providing the budget, and they're the practitioners putting the policy into practice. It's very neat, technical and simple. The only thing is it doesn't work. We've lots of evidence that it doesn't work, including in Scotland, I have to say. So we have to be smarter at understanding the process of change within educational organisations. So what do we know from the research on system level change? And I'm drawing here on the work of other researchers, not just my own work, really. But there are certain things that I've already hinted at which are clear from the research. First of all, policy is made at all levels of an education system, not least at the classroom level. Governments do have a role to play and, you know, I'm happy to work with governments in, uh, in that respect. The local area has a role to play, but most importantly, it's the teacher in the classroom. Consequently, what we can say is. Educational change is technically simple, but socially complex. It's not that difficult to say what needs to happen. But the difficult thing is getting everybody to understand, agree and be prepared to pull in the same direction. So. Clarity of purpose is therefore essential in order to mobilise wide press support. If we're going to use terms like equity and inclusion, we have to be cautious. We have to explain them. We have to articulate them in the way that is it, it, it's kind of palatable, if you will, for people who are extremely busy and don't have a lot of time. So, for example, in the project we're doing at Dundee, we're using a typology there, which I've used in various other places. We call it the three P's. What we're trying to achieve here is improvement of, of children's presence, participation and progress. It's about every child's presence, attendance at the school, participation, being involved in the lessons, having their name used, being valued. And ultimately, it's about learning. It's about progress. So. Evidence, therefore, is the catalyst for making things move forward. We know where we're trying to head. Where are we at the moment on the journey? And it is a journey. And how can we work together to move forward? From working with lots of systems over quite a lot of years, I try to kind of map this out. Next slide. I'm thinking about what are the levers for change within an education system? At the top of, well, in the middle of the diagram, most crucially, are schools. This is about the improvement of schools. It's about schools reviewing themselves and working together to develop their capacity to reach out to all of their learners. But what schools do individually, and as I've stressed in partnership with part with other schools, is impacted upon by other factors, other factors in the wider context of the policy. So at the top of the diagram are the principles upon which the policy is defined. And I've already said what my principle is. Every learner matters and matters equally. When I work with senior people in government, sometimes even occasionally ministers, I say to them, don't have a policy for inclusion. And immediately you can see people cringing and moving their shoulders. What's this about? I say, don't have a policy for inclusion because if it's a policy, it's somebody's business, somebody else's job. Inclusion and equity are principles which have to inform all policy. The curriculum, the budget, the assessment system, teacher education and so on. So it's the principles which are going to be crucial. Then the other crucial crucial factor, it seems to me, in moving a system forward is the use of evidence. And in a way, my own dear country, England, has tested this theory out almost to destruction. What we've learned is in England, and it's there in Scotland to some extent as well, is what gets measured gets done. So if you measure narrow outcomes, test scores, for example, through tests, through inspections, then of course that will dictate where the priorities are within the school. And the mistake we've made in England, more than any other place I've been in the world, is to fall into the trap of valuing what you can measure particularly valuing what things that are relatively easy to measure. Now what we have to do, and it is a kind of, you know, major change of thinking, a paradigm shift, if you will, instead of valuing what we measure, we have to learn how to measure 
what we value. So we have to start from the principle and say, how do we collect evidence that will help us to see where we are on the journey of becoming more inclusive? The other two factors in the diagram are, of course, also important. The role of the local education department, very important in Scotland, for example, where they're very strong, they're much less strong in England, varies a lot from country to country. They also have to be working to the same principles. They also have to be using evidence to hold people in the system accountable. And then last, but certainly not least, is the question of the role of the community. We have to take families with us. We have to take the wider community with us. If families don't believe that a school that is moving in an inclusive direction is in the interest of their children, they will vote with their feet, particularly those who are able to do so. They will take their children somewhere else, possibly to private education. So the involvement of the community is absolutely crucial in all of this. And of course, the community can make so many contributions. We have a colleague, at least one colleague in the, uh, in, the in the in the meeting from Portugal, David Rodriguez, I think, um, and I, I worked on a OECD review last year of Portugal. Um, and we looked at the policies for inclusion and equity in, in that country. My conclusion as in, having been involved in that through visits and talking to people is that as far as I would say, Portugal is possibly the most inclusive education system in the world. It's not perfect, still has challenges, but there are a number of features of the Portuguese uh, procedure which clearly we could learn from, certainly here in the United Kingdom. It is very clearly based on principles. They, they know what they believe in. For example, they use uh, a, a term that I heard the ministers say and I heard people in the schools say. It's not necessary to categorise to intervene. Right? You don't have to categorise children to intervene. And it's a strict view that they have within Portugal. But then another feature of the schools in Portugal is the schools are all in clusters, local area clusters, and they work together. And the director is elected by the local community and serves for four years. And if they do OK, they may serve for another four years and then it's finished. So the leadership is spread more widely and critically, the community is very active involved in supporting what's going on. So there are lessons from places like Portugal, but they're lessons which are difficult to export to somewhere else because they're all tied up with history and democracy and uh, other things that have happened in the local community. So in terms of policy change, if I could go to what is probably the last uh, slide what i'm saying is a series of lessons you can put all these on the screen now if you will what i believe what i try to explain is that education systems have always got as schools have untapped potential networking moving knowledge around within and between schools is crucial and is a way to stimulate innovation School focused strategies have to be complemented with efforts to engage the wider community. And I've, I've, I've under, understated that during this presentation, as I tend to do, but uh, I'm well, well aware from my other colleagues that I've worked with the potential of working with the wider community, not families, of course, most importantly families. But then you think about all the other agencies that are there in the community, the, the businesses, uh, the arts organisation, the sports organisation. I, I worked on a very big project in Greater Manchester some years ago uh, for the government. And I, I went around, I went to the, we have four universities. I went to the universities, I went to the football clubs, I went to the BBC who just moved into the area. And wherever I went, I heard the same. We work with schools, but we could do a lot more. And I think there are there are sort of barriers to do with the traditions of schools and of course, of course, to do with time. That means we don't often have the possibility of using those wider resources. All of this has implications for leadership. As I've said, policy is made at all levels of the system. But for me, the leadership from within schools is crucial. And the systems that have made progress I think they give more authority and autonomy to school leaders. That would be an issue that I would certainly recommend if I was asked to give advice in Scotland, where I think the, the system is not getting the best value from some of the splendid head teachers that I meet as I go around. So there is a role for government. 
to make this happen, to create the conditions, to set the overall goals of, of, of all of this, and to, and to, of course, to hold the system accountable. There has to be accountability. And then one final message before I finish. I lost my helper. Oh dear. Yeah. Technically simple and socially complex. The most important thing then is people working together. And I've seen this in some of the poorest areas of the world when people, parents, teachers, other people in the community want their children to be educated and they work together, then it can happen. The important thing is the collective will uh, to make it happen. I hope that's useful. If anyone wants to keep contact, please get in touch with me. There's one more slide, Di, which is for those of you having, having trouble sleeping, here are some things that you can read and they will certainly send you off to sleep. So thank you for listening and it was good to meet you. Mel, thank you so much. I'm going to hand over to, I, I'm looking at my screen, Lisa, am I handing over to you to wrap things up? Yeah. OK, so I will bring Lisa in just now. OK, well, um, Mel, thank you so much. Indeed, you took us on a journey around the world. There are many more lessons, I think, than the, um, was the five or six that you you highlighted um, lots of lessons for us to take away and I think um, all of us will will prioritize certain um, lessons and ideas based on on um, where where we we are placed what um, role we play um, those of us who work in universities those of us who work with student teachers and um, and practicing teachers need to, I think, um, place more emphasis on this idea of, of working together, this idea, and I've heard you talk about this before, about this idea of schools working together, uh, uh, about this idea of, of teachers being able to um, observe each other's practice. This idea that we need to look inwards to to look at the resources that we have and to to um to find ways to make the most of those resources and to to share those resources i like this i uh, like this um metaphor that you used when you talked about about um uh, visiting another school can can um can serve as a mirror you 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 see your own school you you see perhaps because we are um in in the thick of of our own practice many things and, and we act and we're um uh we're practicing and yes there is reflection during the practice but sometimes when we move to another context it is uh very helpful to to see to to use that context as a mirror so so that i think is very important and that is something that i have to say myself has um has has puzzled me a little bit i work in teacher education uh, yeah. how can we how can we find ways to do that a lot more to to find ways through our our assessments through our the work that we do with, with schools to uh, to find ways to enable teachers to spend more time in each other's classrooms and um and schools working with each other so so to me that was one of the most important lessons that we needed to think about that um level of sharing and collaboration more of course um as you as you said the the untapped potential and and um, the importance of working not only with colleagues with the children themselves our learners for us in universities our students with colleagues 
with families, with communities. It has it has to be that collective will that you said. Um, the three P's, I, I, I really, really like this and I'm, I, I'm <laughs> not sure how I, I missed that. The three P's, that is so important because it can help with this idea of evidence because as we saw in the chat and David, I think mentioned that as well in his in his comment. Um, sometimes we can get a bit lost trying to define and conceptualize and in terms like um, like inclusion or inclusive education can be nebulous as as the, uh, yourself has said sometimes in your in your writings. So maybe finding simpler ways like these three piece and I, I like the older the four um, the access acceptance participation achievement the one that you had done with uh, Tony Booth I think isn't it I think when when I work with students and I like to use that type of framework to help them understand what inclusion is because it can, it can make it, it can contextualize it and it can make it easier, easier to understand. So evidence indeed is, is very important and we need to, to think about how we can, we can use it better, how, what kind of evidence we have available to us, what kind of evidence we can collect and how to use it. And the role of leadership and the role of, of policy makers and, and governments and, and education systems, yes, absolutely very important but uh, going back to the classroom whatever classroom that might be for each of us i think there is a lot um to to think about and take away from today so i think you have enthused us i think you have excited us and i'm sure we'll all be thinking about actions action on taking away actional points i know about things that i'm gonna be talking uh, about with my students when I meet them tomorrow. So just uh, probably I went on a tangent just to to try to to pull a few points together that I spoke to my heart and I'm sure they spoke to uh, to other colleagues as well. Thank you so much from all of us who are here. Thank you so much from um, the CIRA Inclusive Education Network. Thank you. I'm going to pass on to Stella now, Stella, for the closing. All right. Um, Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Mel, for this thought provoking uh, really uh, presentation. There were there were there were more questions, but unfortunately we don't have the time to discuss further. Please feel free to send us your questions and we are going to pass them to Mel if that's OK. Uh, so thanks again, Mel, for this. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the recording will be appearing on Sierra's YouTube, YouTube channel at some point. Uh, and you can find more information about um, the network on our website. So uh, please uh, do keep in touch. Feel free to email us uh, if you want to become a member and join us. Uh, drop us an email and we can add you to our uh, email list so that you can receive our updates about future events. Uh, Mel, I don't know if you if you would like to add something, but thanks again very much for your presentation today. So just to say thank you for all the positive comments I'm seeing. It's very nice. It's very encouraging. And all of you, you know, we all have a role to play in all of this. So uh, go forward and really let's move, march forward under the banner of inclusion and equity. Every learner matters and matters equally. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thanks.